Uh, good to have you. It's good to have you online with us tonight at the project. Uh, I want to let you know something that's actually pretty exciting. Uh, for those of you who are joining us online, if you don't, you, you probably don't know this, but there's actually 31 or so people in our service in person right now. Now you're thinking to yourself, like, why didn't you invite me? Why aren't I there? Uh, where was the invite? We actually, and maybe you heard this, but last week, uh, the province allowed us to actually begin, or churches begin meeting together. And so what we wanted to do with the project to make sure that it was safe, to make sure that we kind of knew and understood how the process was gonna go, we actually have, are doing a couple soft launches. So we have uh, a very particular amount of people here tonight to just see how the registration goes, see what it's like uh, the, with the experience having a mask on and, and kind of sitting individually. And, and we wanted to make sure that we could keep people safe and make sure that we could do it well. And so that's why we have about 30 people in the room right now. And so you're watching along with them. And there's a lot more of you out there than there are in here. And it's kind of weird because it's my first time speaking to people who are actually in front of me. Uh, and we're hoping actually next week we're going to open it up uh, a little bit more. Uh, so far it's going extremely well. And our hope to actually relaunch the project is to come up here in a couple weeks. And so be excited for it. We're pumped. Uh, we're really excited excited to see you, and uh, we're kind of done with the whole COVID thing, but we want to make sure that we do what we can to keep you safe and to keep our neighbors safe, because we just think that's the best way we can love our city, and we can love you and love the people around you and are affected by your life. So that's kind of where we're at. So stay in tune. You're going to have more information come out here this week. We're going to open up some registration for other people who want to be part of another soft launch, but we hope you're doing really well. And we're really excited for our next piece as we get into our new series, Questions for God. So if you see me kind of looking down at people, if you're online, it's because there are actually people here. I'm not pretending. About a year ago or so, uh, I was, you know, you go to those like BuzzFeed lists or whatever, and they tell you like, you know, the top 10 movies you need to watch before you die or go blind or, you know, like the books you need to read before you die. Uh, I, I came across one of those lists and I thought, hey, that's probably a good idea to read that. And, and I, I found out there's actually a poster you can get that has all these like classic books like the Odyssey and other things like that. And, and you can almost like a scratch and sniff, you can scratch off the book covers. And uh, so you can put it in your living, living room. It's a super weird flex, but to show other people how much more cultured you are. And uh, I decided I won't get the poster because it was on Instagram and I don't buy anything off of Instagram because I'm old. And um, I thought... I'm gonna start reading some of these classics though. So I started reading things like Moby Dick, The Catcher in the Rye, and then uh, Mice and Men, and then I actually read this book, 1984. I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't, listen to the description of this book. I'm gonna read it word for word, this is what it says. So 1984 is a dystopian novella by George Orwell, published in 1949, so he's projecting into the future which follows the life of Winston Smith, a law-ranking member, member of the party, who was frustrated by the omnipresent eyes of the party and its ominous ruler, Big Brother. That's where the whole term actually comes from. Controls every aspect of people's lives. So Orwell effectively explores the themes of mass media control, government surveillance, totalitarianism, and how a dictator can manipulate and control history, thoughts, and lives in such a way that no one can escape it. Think the Hunger Games with like a lot less flair. That's kind of what 1984 is about. You read these books and you kind of watch these movies and you kind of get an idea of like how some of this stuff gets justified, how we kind of fall into it. Like, let's say he was thinking this is what 1984 is going to look like. You're thinking the Hunger Games and you're like, that would never happen. But you can kind of see how it would justifiably happen. Think about it. It removes uncertainty. It removes risk. It attempts to build life out of merit, out of doing something with your hands and, and doing it for other people. It orders a bit of life and everyone does something for the benefit of the other. So you can kind of see how it can turn out this way. But none of us would actually probably want the life of 1984 or fighting other kids of various ages for food. But the way that like the cost of post-secondary is going, you may actually have to do that sooner than you think. No one wants to be in a situation where we're kind of stay controlled, right? Because it's like, it's dehumanizing. It removes the humanness of us. Our personhood is like limited to utility. Our relationships are all transactional. What you do for me and, 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 and what I do for you and how we can make something out of that. Individuality is actually totally erased. Purpose is obligatory rather than exploratory. So it's like, I tell you what you do. I tell you what you're good at. And that's kind of the way it's going to be. And you can't explore anything creatively. And peace is secured by fear. The idea is like, don't step back out. Don't do anything wrong. If you stay in line, everything is going to kind of be okay. It's a bit of a fake piece. And plus, whenever you watch those movies, like their clothing is terrible. So there's that part too. And it's why we love the hero though. They buck the system. 
They kind of break through the state and the crust of kind of like monotony and, and it rehumanizes the individual and the community. It's almost like they show another, they show a better way of living. And that's why we kind of gravitate to it. I love those kinds of movies. Interestingly enough though, when I read and I read books like 1984, it actually like really sadly, and this sounds terrible, but it sadly reminds me of the kind of Christianity and I was taught to live from a young age. Maybe it sounds something like this. The Christians I know don't seem to have the freedom to think for themselves. I mean, to many, like following Jesus seems like a daunting task. Think about, think about what we've asked you to do. Think about what we've been telling you. Think about what it means to follow Jesus and what that entails for you. Do, do you think of things like freedom? Do you think of things like fun? But think of even some of the language that we use. Give your life to Jesus. Imagine if someone were walking along the road, their name was Jesus, and they said, hey, do you want to follow me? And you're like, yeah, you seem like a good dude. Drop everything you have and follow me. Your life is not your own. You'll be okay as long as you follow the rules and you don't stray far. That's kind of the Christianity you grew up with. Okay, funny, I remember this one time my youth pastor actually drove to a high school dance to find out which youth went to the dance and didn't go to church that night. Needless to say, he wasn't very famous after that. And honestly, I think sometimes as followers, we kind of give it that sense of what following Jesus is like. Think about the questions you have. Think about the things that you're concerned about. What if I miss the will of God? What if I make the wrong decision? What if they aren't the right person for me? I need to pray about it. It's like, dude, you're just going to the can. You don't need to pray about it. But I feel like anything is like, I need to pray about it. What if I miss out? What does God's will look like? What does it sound like? What's it gonna be like? It sounds like people who are actually really scared. And our peace is more about staying in line. I don't, I don't know about you. I could be off, but that's what Christianity and growing up as a Christian kind of felt like. Stay in line. God, I wanna make sure I don't mess things up. How do I make sure I don't? What are I, just the right actions. And I get it, like never more at this age, as we kind of figure out who we are, we want to know that our lives mean something. We want to know that we're going to be okay, that we're going to make the right decisions. We want to know that we're going to avoid the bad decisions, that our relationships will be healthy, our relationships will be secure. How do I do the right things to make sure we don't get divorced? And that what we do matters to people around us and matters to our world. No one wants to end up on the wrong side of God. Everyone desires God's blessing and not one of us wants to make the wrong move. So we ask questions like this, what is God's will? And how much control does he have over it? How much control do I have over it? It is actually a major question that you asked us when we asked you what questions you have for God. And it's this, what is God's will for my life? Or, or kind of like questions around that. How much control does he have? How do I make sure I'm inside of it? Why am I here? All these things relate to God's purposes for your life. But is Christianity really that great if it's micromanaged? Is Christianity and following God really that much worth it if your life is just consistently micromanaged by God? Is that living? And here's a problem I've kind of seen with this understanding between God's will and, and our life. On the Christian side of things, I see a lot of Christians, and, and, and including myself, who are almost too scared to do anything. They're fearful. They don't want to make decisions. It's kind of like to hold up on it. Let's to wait on it. You know, make sure, I just want to make sure I do this. You know, it's like, hey, should I go on a missions trip? You know, I'm just praying about it. Why do you, you know, like, okay, so everything is a prayer. Everything is fear, but it's not, it sounds really like, it sounds really mature, but really it's just fear. Or there's Christians who just grow up indifferent to it. It's like, it's so hard. I feel like I, I'm never really on the right angle on things. And so they kind of grow indifferent to God's will for their life. It's like, I don't even want to worry about it anymore. And other questions, it just leads to a lot of frustration. It's like, why am I not hearing from God? I've prayed for this and it's not showed up. What is going on? Doesn't he love me? Doesn't he have a plan for my life? And we get super frustrated about it. And so what happens is that it's manifests itself into like morality-based religion often. It's as long as you do the right things, God should actually give you something back. And it moves into a bit of like a fear-mongering. If you're not doing the right things, don't expect things from God. I am a better Christian than you are. And we wouldn't say it that way, but don't we sometimes feel that way? 
or it just leads to a lot of Christians walking away from faith totally. I want more freedom. I want my life to sound like that, to look like that. I want more. And then maybe people looking in, so people who maybe don't know Jesus yet, maybe you're here and you're watching it online with us. Looking in, it kind of seems that we've like joined a cult. We joined a cult with a demanding big brother and nobody seems interested in that kind of religion these days. Tim Keller, he's a pastor and he's an author and he wrote this book called The Reason for God and he says this. Nope, wrong direction. Christianity looks like an enemy of social cohesion, cultural adaptability, and even authentic personhood. However, this objection is based on mistakes about the nature of truth, community, Christianity, and liberty itself. What I want to do is I actually want to go to the beginning. I want the beginning of all this and actually help you figure out what God's will is because I think it's known. I think it's actually really obvious and to be honest, it's very freeing. I want to go right to the beginning, the beginning of the Bible. So if you're not familiar with the Bible, the beginning of the Bible is literally the first book. It's called Genesis. Genesis literally means beginning and we're going to the first chapter. So I'm, I've made it super simple. And I just want to read a little bit to you because I want to give a bit of context. So he made this whole world and then he gets to making men and women. And he says this, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the li- livestock, all the wind animals in the earth. It literally, it literally sounds like the MCU here. And the small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image, in the image of God. He created them male and female. He created them. Now, I want you to notice he said he created them three times. Whenever the Bible repeats something in the same verse three times, he paid attention to it. And then he moves on. Then God blessed them. And he said this, this is your job. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Then God said, look, I've given you every seed-bearing plant throughout the earth and all the fruit trees for your food. I've given it to you. I've given all of it. And I've given every green plant as food for all the wild animals, the birds in the sky, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. Everything that has life, I have given to you. One more from the beginning. This is the next chapter, chapter two. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned them, you may freely eat the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. So here's the thing. Basically says, I've given you the entire world to, that I've created for you to actually enjoy to recreate with, to work and be satisfied by. My presence is among you. My power is here to sustain all of life so you don't have to worry about it. I've given everything for you. I've made everything. I'm sustaining everything. There's just one thing. One thing I want you to know. Don't eat from that one tree. You can eat anything else you want. You want a ribeye? Go for it. You want a lamb chop? Do it. You want to eat all the mangoes you want? Have fun peeling it? Eat your heart out. You can have everything, just not this one thing. Why? He says, because it's going to kill you. Glorifying God in this setting, God's will in this setting right from the beginning was this, knowing him, enjoying the world he gave you, and being the person he made you into. That was God's will. That was it. He just doesn't want you to die. I've given you this whole world. I want you to play with it. I want you to discover everything I've made it with. I want you to discover who you are. I want you to discover what it likes to have a relationship with me and someone else. I want you to do that, to have that freedom. Just don't do that one thing. Why? Because it's going to kill you. Just don't do it. Spoiler alert, even though they actually messed up and sin entered the world, God's MO about his will doesn't actually change much through scripture. If we moved on later in the Old Testament, there's this book called Micah, and it's, it, it's a, this prophet speaking on behalf of God, and they're wondering, what do I do? And God is telling them, this is what life is about. I'm going to tell you exactly what life needs to look like, what I'm desiring for you. I want you to know exactly what my will is for your life. And it sounds a bit like this. He says this in Micah 6, 8, what can we bring to the Lord? Should we bring him burnt offerings? So what can I do for you? What can I provide for you, God, to make you happy, to appease you? Should we bow before God most high with offerings of yearling calves? Should we offer him thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? 
Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay our sins? Now, this is incredible. So you can tell it's getting like that much bigger. What should I give you? And this is God speaking. And he says this, no, oh people, the Lord has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let's move fast forward. Let's go to the New Testament, okay? This is Jesus now. So it's Jesus, you definitely have to pay attention. In a chapter about these people worrying about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear. I mean, he was talking with people who didn't have a lot. In fact, they were subjugated by a lot of different rulers, whether it was, it was political or religious rulers. He's talking to people who didn't have a lot. And it, it's, it literally is called the chapter of worry. And he ends it with this. He says, so don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So he says, don't worry about those things. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live right. And he will give you everything you need. At the end of the day, that's what I want you to do. In fact, he summarizes it even more. Later on in Matthew, in chapter 22, says this, teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on those two commandments. Everything that you read about in the Old Testament, everything, all the different laws and guidelines that you read about, all comes down to those two things. Love God, love others. Two most important things you can do with your life. If we were to even go further in the New Testament, written by another guy, John. In a book called 1 John, says this, if anyone claims I'm living in the light, but hates a fellow believer, that person is still living in darkness. Anyone who loves a fellow believer is living in the light and does not cause others to stumble. Basically, if you love God, it should turn out because you're loving other people. If you don't love other people, it means they're not actually correctly loving God. His whole book, actually three of them, were based on that right there, on how we love each other. It should come out of a heart that actually loves God. God's will has actually always been clear throughout scripture. It's been clear, known, and reproducible since Adam. It's been very clear. And I think this is probably one of the most frustrating things for us to understand and grip, that it has been clear, that it's not a mystery, that he's not hiding your will somewhere in your closet that you can't find. It's not in Narnia. It's, it is literally very clear, and it's been throughout scripture. And it starts with knowing these two things, that you were made in God's image. Right at the beginning, you were made in the image of God. He created you not out of indifference, but out of love and out of purpose. You're made by God. That is a huge piece to knowing God's will for your life is that you were made by him because the second is just as important and it flows from this. You were made for God's glory. You were made to bring glory for God. What I mean by that is not just that your purpose is to glorify God, but he made you with the ability to glorify God. This is God's will for your life. This is it in one sentence. Two words, glorify God. If someone asks me, what is God's will for my life? I tell them, it's this, glorify God. In everything you do, in all that you are, if you glorify God, you're going the right direction. You're doing the right thing. God will take care of the rest. Why? Because he says, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness and living right, and I will take care of the rest. God's will for your life is very simple. And isn't it so frustrating? Because I know you're thinking, no, like, honestly, give me a little bit more specifics. It's gotta be a lot more specific than that. Glorify God. And whatever you do or say, do it as representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks for him, God the Father. It's the same thing. Whatever you do, glorify God. And the opposite of that is actually to move away from God's will for you. It's to be indifferent to what he has for you. He says that what is producing death is basically to take your own life in your own hands. That's what that tree represented in the, in the Garden of Eden was taking your life in your own hands, that you become God. He says, no, the chief end of man is that to glorify God. And this is what glorifying God looks like. You find, first of all, you're being in him. 
there's this word that we throw around in the church called surrender, and it's pretty nebulous. Surrendering literally means just like you were born, you didn't get here on your own. It's recognize that whether you were naturally born out of indifference or born out of love, you didn't get here by yourself. And God has created you. He didn't, you didn't just show up. He created you with intention and with love. And so it means that we have our being in him. We go after him. We, we flow from him. We move in relationship to him and move out of that relationship with him. It means this too. It means discovering his fingerprints in our lives. What I mean by this is what gifts or talents do you have? What are your passions? What drives you? What really makes, like, stirs you up? What are you great at? What are you moving towards? What are you discovering about yourself? Because here's the thing. Think about the traits you have with your mom and your dad, whether you like them or not. My dad was not good at building things. I definitely got that trait from him. I keep trying. I suck at it. My mom, she bites her fingernails. I do the same thing. I know it's gross. But have you ever thought that you actually have traits from your heavenly father? If you were made in his image, then he has fingerprints in your life. And part of glorifying God is actually discovering how he's created you. These gifts, these passions, these talents, the opportunities he's placed you in. And it means using those things. Listen, being good at, you, at being you is part of glorifying God because he made you. He wants you to know how he's created you. So it's not just having your being in him, but it's also discovering how he's made you and being good at that. And the third thing is this, we find throughout scripture is how we treat other people. And the way you treat other people is easier for them to see God. Is it easier to them to see how God loves them, how God has made them? Do you glorify God by how you treat other people towards God? Literally throughout scripture, this is what you see over and over and over again. God's will is this, is that you'd find your being in him, you discover his fingerprints in yourself and how you treat other people. That is God's will. God's will for your life is to enjoy him, his creation, discover the person he made you to be, and love others. To sin means to do the opposite. It means to glorify yourself. It means to glorify God no matter what. No matter who you are, where you're at, what you're facing, what economic or other barriers you're facing, we can all, we can all do that. It transcends. You think like, really, like, he's not micromanaging me? Because it still seems pretty nebulous. It seems like it's really out there. And I think we're actually kind of scared of this because it seems like too much freedom. See, I was trained for a lot of years not to have that kind of freedom when it comes to my relationship with God and Christianity. But the reality is, is that he does give us this freedom. And I think that's the biggest issue here. It's scary growing up and trusting ourselves. As we try and trust God, we want to do the things God wants us to do, or we just, don't want, to, we just want to make sure that we're going to be all right. And I think there's, it's scary. Like, am I doing the right kind of glorifying God? But I think we forget what this freedom implies for us though. If God has given us this kind of freedom, what is it implying? It's implying this, that first of all, that he is placing trust in you. That God literally trusts you to glorify him. He trusts you in working out what it means to be a Christian. He trusts you with what he wants you to accomplish. He's not insecure. He's not anxious. He's not worried about your life. And I know sometimes it starts like, what if I fall out of God's will? God's not like, oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. He knows it. He trusts you. And he's given you his words. He's given you his spirit and he's given you his example. It also means that there's a tons of freedom because glorifying God will look different for every single person in this room and every single person watching online. Glorifying God will look different to all of you, to all of us. That's the point. You don't all need to be a pastor to do God's will. In fact, whatever job you do, whatever job I do, is just as important to God. It's just, what are you doing with it? So how we choose to use our gifts and opportunities to glorify him. Because here's the reality. You may be wondering, what's God's will for my life? Like, what's that career that he has for me? Honestly, you may find something, but then you got to realize your career passions may change in 10 years. 
He says, what do you know now? It also means he's giving responsibility that where you see evil, that's where you can be light. It means that you can expect divine intervention, that what you need when you pray, he listens. In fact, isn't that what we read? Is that when we pray according to his will, he will provide everything we need? Isn't that literally what he just said? It means that we're also undergirded with all these promises he's given us. He's promised that in the midst of glorifying him, in all our worry, because he doesn't want you worried, he says this, I will never leave you. My love will never fail you. I am still in control. I'll always be making things new. I am the beginning and the end, not you. My work is going to be ongoing in you until you die. I am consistently interceding for you and I will empower you. This almost removes any excuse not to just go out there and try to glorify God with, wherever, with whoever we are, whatever we have in our hand, whatever opportunities in front of us. Glorify God. Now listen. He cares about your job. He cares about your relationships. He cares about what you're concerned about. But when it comes to his will in all of this, you don't need to pray about it. Just glorify God with your life. So do your relationships do that? Do your relationships glorify God? Do they help you discover who God is? Do they help you discover who you're becoming? And is God using that to grow you and shape you? Do you treat each other in a way that God treats you? Are you doing it in your job or do you see it as just a nine to five gig? Or do you see it as like, how can I use my job and do it unto God? That whatever I do, I do for him. How can I glorify? Do, do you glorify God with your job? What about your financial decisions? Are you withholding love from someone in the form of forgiveness or grace or attention or service or help? Are you glorifying God? He cares about your life. Jesus even tells us to pray about the things that we need. At the end of the day, he's given us a world to enjoy and to play with. To discover what it looks like to see God in our life and in the lives of those around us. It is not a straight line and he's not trying to drag you by a horse down a certain trajectory at the beginning, I've created this world for you. I made you with intention and with love. I can hold all things. I can sustain all things. Do what's right. Glorify me. Know me. Know how I made you. And love others like I love you. How do we shape the next best move though? Maybe you're in the midst of a decision and you're like, I don't really know which one's the best one to do. How do we do that? How do we shape the next best move? How do we understand to have maybe cultivate a natural response to glorifying God? And I think about, so David, uh, he, he's, you know, if you're not familiar with the Bible, he's known as one of the greatest kings in the Old Testament. And it's interesting, he was called to be king before he ever became king, when he was called to be king, there actually was a number of, there, there was a good amount of time between him being said he's gonna be king and actually becoming king. And uh, his brothers went out to war and his dad asked them, I need you to go bring lunch to your warrior brothers. And if I think to myself, a king doesn't bring lunch to other people. But in David's life, that was his next best move. He knew God had called him. He knew God had made him. He knew God had purposed him, but he didn't know what the next move was. He didn't know how it was gonna work out he just knew that his next best move was to obey his dad. So he brought a sandwich to his brothers, basically. And it's in that moment where he, everything changed for him. All because of a sandwich. What does a next best move look like? How do we cultivate a responsiveness to maybe what God is doing? If we are praying, if we're trying to understand, how do we do it? And, and this is where I'm gonna kind of begin ending here. The first is scripture. You gotta think the first part of glorifying God is actually knowing God. 
It's to know what glorifies them. It's to know what is right. It's to know what does justice look like? What does mercy look like? What does grace look like? What do you mean love my enemies? What do you mean to act in justice? What do you mean to stand up for the oppressed? What does it mean to do that? It's cultivating an attitude towards scripture. You're going, as more, the more that I know about God, the easier it is for me to define what pleases him. Scripture. The second is this. Y'all gotta be praying. I'm not, I'm not discounting prayer. Sometimes the question is, well, do my prayers change God's mind? And I'd say this, prayer more shapes us than it does shapes God. And often it's that place we don't really know what to do. We're trying to figure out things. I would say prayer is that place where I think God helps us recognize his will and recognize what he's doing in our life and mostly recognize the opportunity that's right in front of us. Prayer is a place where we bring our concerns. A prayer is a place where our heart and our mind are shaped again to his. That when we say, God, it's hard for me not to worry, God reminds us why we don't have to worry. Scripture, prayer, community. This is why through Proverbs you hear things like, you know, a, a counsel. Like having a counsel of people to walk through is wise. I see through it Scripture too. I think this one time so when Paul, who wrote the majority of the New Testament, there's a guy named Peter who was one of the disciples. And what's really interesting, Paul calls Peter out in, I think it's the book of Ephesians, or I think it's Galatians, actually. Because Peter refused to sit with Gentiles. He was Jewish. And Paul calls him out. He says, why are you showing favoritism? Don't you know that the grace of God and salvation is for all men? And he calls him out. And there's community shaping. I think back on my life, how many people are involved in decisions that I've made and, and, and praying with them about it and hearing their counsel. One of the gifts that God has given us is community. Listen, when God made Adam, he said, it's not good for you to be alone and made Eve. It wasn't just for sex. It was actually for companionship. It was for relatedness. We're created for relatedness. We need community. And this is probably one of the more frustrating pieces, and it's this. Trial and error. This is the worst. Can I say something here though? And I think it's something that you need to hold on to throughout this time of life. You are only held accountable to what you know now, not about what your future holds. God is not keeping you accountable to something you don't know. He's only keeping you accountable to what you know right now. So what do you know? What's in front of you? What's in your hand? What opportunities do you have? And are you glorifying God? And I'll say this, you're gonna make mistakes. You probably need to make mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes. The only way that I've seen God work is if I'm just willing to risk it and try it out. And I say this, if you find yourself in the right, wrong place, I'd rather be found there than doing nothing. Trial and error. You are made in God's image. And you're made to glorify him. That is God's will for your life. My challenge to you is not to help you figure out the specifics of your next move. So ask yourself this question. In my life, as I reflect and look at it, am I glorifying God? Am I doing what he asked me to do? Am I doing what he created me to do? Am I loving other people the way that he created me to love them? Sometimes we don't know what life is gonna hold. I can't tell you what your tomorrow is gonna look like. But I can tell you this, you're only accountable to glorifying God right now in this moment. What does that look like? And do that. And Jesus says, seek first my kingdom of righteousness. I'll take care of the rest. And you may be here, maybe you're watching us online and maybe it's the first time interacting with the project. This is a bit of a heavier thing here. Maybe you didn't hear that there's a reality that God has actually made you with meaning and with purpose, but also with an immense amount of freedom to creatively see how God is working in you and out of you and around you. We always say that Jesus didn't ask us to come and believe everything I say. He says, come and follow me. And part of following him is listening to him, is walking with him and trying to figure it out. I mean, that's really the Christian life. If you don't know where to start, we tell people, just text the word next to the number 555 You're gonna get a digital booklet. No one's gonna follow up with you if you don't want it. It's gonna be anonymous. 
It's a way for you to begin looking at what does it look like to follow Jesus, and that's it. Tonight, um, we're, I'm actually, I actually asked Pastor Brett to come and uh, lead us in just one song before you go, and then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to pray for you. But I just want to encourage you and remind you, some of this may be a little bit difficult because you're thinking, man, it seems still pretty nebulous, or it seems like it's just too, too much freedom. But I wanted to remind you, God created you for joy. He created you to enjoy what he's made. And this is a hard time of life because I think we want a lot of answers. And I want to encourage you. The only thing I really want you to feel the weight of is just looking at your life and asking yourself, and what am I doing? Am I glorifying God? Am I growing towards him? Am I figuring out how he's made me? And am I using those gifts, those talents, those skills, and opportunity? And lastly, and am I just loving people well around me? And I look over my life and I see how God has been super faithful in those moments. I had no idea what I was doing. In those moments where I felt like I didn't know what I'm doing, God has been faithful.
uh, pray together. Jesus, thank you. God, that you have created us. In your image, you created us with intention, with purpose, and with such great love. You made us, Lord, to know that and to glorify you, which means to discover, God, the goodness of what you created, the goodness that you have built into us. And God, to be the kind of people who, who love others like you love us. God, it's frustrating sometimes to, know, to not know exactly what's next. But Jesus, this is, a, this is a position of trust. How do I just continue to do what I know you've called me to do to glorify you even in the midst of the unknown? And trust and know that God, you are in all things and you sustain all things. That you're not worried or anxious, but God, you hold our life in your hands. God, that we would live that way. And Lord, for every single person that is either in this room or you're, you're watching online, Jesus, I pray that God, you would be with them, your presence would be felt among them, that those who are seeking and asking questions about you, God, that they would find you. And Lord, as we think over the next bit, I know there's a lot of people wondering what the fall and what that's gonna look like and school's changing and jobs are kind of up in the air. God, I pray for your peace. I pray, Jesus, not glibly, but God, that they would know that you know that you are concerned. And Jesus, help us and give us the strength and empower us to glorify you. Amen. If you're online, thanks for watching with us. And like I said, stay tuned because uh, we're in the process of going through these stages of reopening of the project. And we'd love to see this room to its capacity with two meters apart. Uh, have you all in here. So thanks for watching online. Uh, whether you're watching it on Sunday night, you're watching it a little later down the road, uh, share it with someone who maybe needs to hear this. But uh, all in all, we're thankful for you, we're praying for you, and we can't wait to see you. Have a great Sunday or whatever day it is, and we'll see you next week.